and your life. I know. What's up, everybody in the neighborhood? All other folks out here. Um, so I'm going to wait until exactly 5 p.m. before we get this started. Um, I'll say the same things to people kind of over and over again in the beginning. So be prepped. Um, have have your wines poured. Woot, woot. Um, yeah, I hope everybody does have everything poured in advance. Um, we're going to taste the wines just in this in exactly the way the order I have pictured below um, the Yves Couleron uh, Vendée uh Syrah from uh, the Northern Rhone uh, the uh, raw power Shiraz from the Adelaide Hills in South Australia and then the um, Mettler Petite Syrah from Lodi in California. Le vin de acute. Man, I really should have practiced on pronoun pronouncing choline rhodonines, but we'll do that. All right, it's officially 5 p.m. So let me see how many folks are up there. Uh, yeah. All right. I got a bunch of folks watching now. Okay. I do want to note this. We're going to start this. Thanks for everybody coming to see Ray's virtual tasting. Um, I'm going to do a Tuscany one in two weeks from now. I'll put some other events up very, very soon, early next week. Um, we have had a couple brief power surges at the store. So we noted this just now in the uh, comment section of our YouTube live stream. Um, if, if we do, if the stream does end, we should be able to hopefully get it up and going again relatively soon. But that is a, that potentially could happen. It was very odd. We, there were actually power surges. So... Hopefully that'll be good. Um, man, everybody, okay, just chill if you're out there. Like, are you starting without us? I'm just going to let everybody get, uh, you know, get acclimated for a little while and do the odds and ends here. Folks out there, if you haven't done a virtual tasting with your friends at Ray's yet, um, I am Nate Norfolk, Ray's Wine and Spirits Director. I'm also a certified sommelier. Um, I'm... Uh, uh, a Syrah uh, enthusiast. Um, I also like floral pad and, sh pad and shirts. If you know me, you know that. Um, so if everybody can, I'd hope that you're going to pour the three wines and have them all in front of you in the manner that I have them below. So first and foremost, the Yves Couleron Syrah. Secondly, the Raw Power Shiraz. And uh, third, the Mettler Petite Syrah. If you can line them up and have them in front of you in that manner, that would be optimal. Um, these wines, the beauty of, of Syrah um, and Petite Syrah based wines is like, man, they can really, really, really take some oxygen. And uh, th these wines should be good for a couple days, even if you just leave them out at room temperature. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bank on saying that. Um, a lot of times... If I actually, it, Petit Syrah is one of those, Petit Syrah and Syrah Shiraz are one of those things that I usually don't, um, I love to see how the wines develop over uh, the course of 24 to 48 hours. Um, I do typically throw red wines when they're open. I personally put them in the fridge. Sometimes I do the little um, private preserve spray. I've also got the little pumpy guy at home that um, I don't use too often. I do the private preserve pretty often though too. Um, but I find that Petit Syrah is um, really, really will hold up good for 24 to 48 hours. And Syrah, both Syrah and Petit Syrah, and they open up very, very well um, and will develop. And they love a little bit of air. 
Okay, so I'm just going with this. Okay, so everybody should have these three wines in front of them. Um, like, and I'll, I hopefully won't go back and forth between them too much. We'll get going on this. Uh, yeah, I do want to say this for folks that are new to this, like, like, and, and this is mean, maybe this is going to be very um, uh, apparent to folks that already know this. Sorry, so the redundancy. But Syrah and Shiraz, these are the same grape variety. They're just synonyms, right? And typically in, in Australia, the grape is referred to as Shiraz. Um, throughout the rest of the world, nowadays, it's known as uh, Syrah. Um, I know the beard is getting pretty intense, folks. I'm, I'm seeing the Abe Lincoln um, notes and like Abe didn't have the mustache. You know, he did that weird thing like he was Amish or something. Um, I think it's going to get I think it's going to get cut back a little bit this weekend. We'll see. You know, I, I did. It's amazing how much grooming it takes to just make me not look like an Ewok. Um, whew. This that is that is wine out my nose funny. Four score and seven bottles ago. Oh, okay, got it. These are getting, the sillies are getting really silly on the comment thread already. So folks, if any of you are new, just if you're logged into YouTube, you can do a, a written chat function. And I try to answer questions as we go along. Throw out any question. I hope it's pertinent to the subject matter we're addressing here today. Uh, if not, my enthusiasm to answer it will be uh, uh, greatly diminished. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is smell these wines, and they smell totally, totally great. Let's go, if you can, if you've got them all open, like give them a sniff, the three of them. Just take, you know, the, the Couleron Syrah to me is just like total boysenberries and like, like really like, like a sour plum in a good way. Um, also slightly floral and has a meaty kind of cracked pepper character to it. The raw power Shiraz is like, like sweet smoke, cedar minty has a like mint eucalyptus it's like really rosemary thing going on and a little little bit of a bacon kind of character to it too and this mettler petite syrah is very floral to me um has almost like a jasmine like lang lang um really cool flower character to it and and like dark dark fruit like prune plum blackberry a little bit of a sage character on this too um hmm. wow all right so let's talk about syrah syrah is really one of the world's most popular grape varieties and it's uh indigenous to eastern france um, the, the parents of this grape are, um, uh, a really obscure, uh, red grape called Duriza, which is from, uh, probably the Jura kind of subalpine area of Eastern France slash Switzerland. And then this Mandus Blanche, um, which is, um, which is also indigenous to Southern France. These were just a very, very bizarre uh, genetic crossing that probably happened probably around a thousand years ago. Um, when we talk about Syrah based wines, we're, we're almost exclusively referring to, um, you know, full bodied dried red still wines, wines that don't have any sparkle or bubble to them. There's people that make sparkling wine from Syrah or Shiraz. That's, that's rather full body, but mostly we're talking about full body, dry, super rich red wines. Um, so it, it, it is, it's both grown in cool and warm climates, hence the northern Rhone where Syrah is indigenous to is close to Lyon in France. And by no means is this like, you know, it's not Los Angeles here, folks. It's, it doesn't really, I mean, it rarely snows there, but it's um, still relatively cool. 
um, warmer than Wisconsin, but by no means like are you you know are 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 we are we doing the whole um, palm tree thing yet there? Where in the southern part of the Rhone we do, but but Syrah is both you know cool and climates. Um, one of its great grandparents is Pinot Noir, um, and then this is a cool word down here at the bottom. Rotundone. I talk about this a lot with Syrah, and this is one of the reasons Syrah, um, Syrah and Shiraz-based wines have that really cool peppery kind of smell to them. Rotundone is just something that's intrinsic to Syrah-based grapes and um, or Syrah-based wines, and this is the smell that when we think about black pepper, this is the molecule that makes black pepper smell like black pepper. And it's really in there with a lot of Syrah and Shiraz based wines. Um, we'll see that, and, and that's why they, they're such a great pairing for foods that have a black pepper character to them. Um, let's everybody, everybody try this, this first wine, the Kuleran uh, Syrah, okay? So I also do want to point out, you know, like this is here, this, you know, this little kind of generic chart of like body and color compared to other wine. Really, this is, I don't know how super, super fair this is, but you know, we got Pinot Noir as lighter on here on the lighter side. And then Syrah can really, really be extracted, dark, rich, um, and full bodied. Um, and I usually, if we're doing a, a big, big tasting of wine, at the shop, I usually put Syrah and Petite Syrah based wines um, last, like past Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh man. Wow, lots of lip smacking noises. Yves Couleron, who makes this wine, is, is kind of known for. Um, He's also known for making Viognier, and um, this is aged in a combination of, I mean, half of it is done in tank, and half of it is done in with some wood aging to it. Um, it mostly, I'm showing you this map of the Rhone Valley here, because this is the area that we, we first started to cultivate Syrah and make fine wines. Um, and specifically, you'll see that, uh, you know, in the larger map of France, this is very, very so far south from Paris. Um, and right kind of where I've got La Melle Cursor Guy, this is where, where like Lyon would be, which is the second largest city in France. Um, and the Rhone Valley, the northern Rhone is just south of Lyon. Most of where this wine particularly is harvested is around the area of Saint Joseph, um, and this is a hundred percent Syrah. Um, <laughs> holy pepper! Yeah, this does have a really kind of peppery character to it, and this is a really pep, that that rotondone thing is like really one of the ways to spot Syrah based wines or blends with Syrah in them in uh, blind tastings. So once again, when we look at this map here, and this is, you know, when we look in the, the subset here, this is about roughly, um, it's not quite 50 miles, probably north to south. And these are the major regions in France that make Syrah. And they really hug against the, um, the western side of the Rhone River um, and the main areas, and this is where some of the most expensive Syrah based wines in the world come from, especially in this area in the red up here is called Corroti, which means the roasted slope in French and Corroti wines very frequently exceed a hundred dollars a bottle, but even budget, budget versions of Corroti are usually in the, you know, 60 to $80 range. Um, and then we have Chateau Grillet, which is exclusively makes Viognier and, and Condrieu and Condrieu and Saint Joseph overlap here. Condrieu is a, a Viognier only appellation, but this area in kind of the light blue is really the largest, uh, um, appellation for, 
um, uh, all you know Syrah-based wines in the Northern Rhone. It's called Saint Joseph. It's roughly uh, thirty miles north to south, and only a few miles at its greatest width. Um, you can uh, also call the wines from this area. You could you could declassify them and call them Cote du Rhone if you want to. But really, these are very prestigious appellations. Most of what we're concerned with is this wine is like basically declassified Saint Joseph. He's He's, uh, Yves Coulouran is just calling this by its varietal name, Syrah. He's probably sourcing some of the fruit from outside of the, the Appalachian. Um, tell me if I'm going too, too crazy here with the, I'm really sprouting out wine terms now. But this is really where Syrah's birthplace is. And to give everybody an idea, this is in, in this area, San Joseph, that I pointed out. This is not the vineyard that this wine comes from, but this is, um, this is, this is the, the Leudi. This is the uh, vineyard that the appellation San Joseph is named after, um, which are, are, you notice these are incredibly steep, uh, and sometimes they're walled vineyards. These have been vineyards since, like, for most of these have been vineyards for at least 2,000 years in some capacity or another on the western bank and south-facing slopes of the Rhone Valley. Um, this area, you can also grow white wine, uh, uh, Roussan and uh, um, Marsan are, are frequently grown alongside a Syrah in this area, um, along with Viognier. Uh, I could get the details of the each app appellation are kind of intense. Nonetheless, this is really, really what the topography is like. And most of these are, are what we call gr it's granitic soils and like alluvial soils. And alluvial soils are are um, soils that that were once uh, uh, underwater. So and that granite uh, rock character is is something that is great. Syrah is grown in granite. A um, little bit about the wine here. I know this is a lot of verbiage. Uh, Yves Couleran, he started his winery, uh, his family, he's the third generation, but really took over the winery in 1987. Um, this is his kind of baseline wine. And, and by that, I mean, he makes um, around 7,000 cases of this or so. Oh, man. Delish. The winery itself produces roughly around 40,000 cases of wine, and he makes about 20 or so different wines. Mm. Man. What's great about this wine, it's like, it's only 13% alcohol, too. So, this is definitely, when we, once again, when we talk about wines and and, and their potential for alcohol and how strong they are. A lot of times this has to do with wines from warmer places are just going to be riper and have the potential to be stronger. That's a really basic nutshell idea. We're dealing with a, a relatively cool climate when we're dealing with the Northern Rhone. Um, you know, folks are saying this is super peppery. Stephanie's saying it's um, it's good with Parmesan. I, I love Syrah with, um, with cheeses. Um, I find it's really, really good with soft cheeses um, because the tannin doesn't get in the way with soft cheeses. Um, but it's like earthy, savory, funky, complex side com combined with like really, really ripe fruit is is just it, it's I think I think what I love about wines from this area specifically is they're they're both intense and complex and there's a lot of complexity and savory things going on but really explicit fruit flavors too. Um, so this is interesting in the, the he does, um, he, he ages or ferments some of this wine with the stem still on, which kind of heightens that spicy character to it. Um, and it's a really classic thing to do as far as a winemaker, winemaking is concerned. Um, you got to be careful because the wine can um, go a little bit, you know, a little bit overboard. If you do it, you know, if somebody leaves too many stem stems on. Oh, what would be my favorite cheese with this? Oh, wow. Um, 
Oh, wow. Great, great question. You know, if you were going to do something... Wow, there's a great kind of brie type cheese called Jasper Hill out of Missouri. Um, or, you know, I would do like like brie and camembert or or like if you get a interestingly, I would love to try this with like real like actual um, uh, Munster from Elsass too, I think would be really, really good. I think soft, I just softer cheeses kind of just come to mind. Um, but nothing blue, you know, and something that's a wash rind or, um, I've had this, I've had like Syrah like this with the, the Chimay cheese too from Belgium. Um, love, love, love that. You know, I find sometimes the, the harder, um, cow's milk aged cheeses, uh, are, um, tend to like, tend to be like, like I get an intense dry sensation with those and like really, really big red wines. Um, oh yeah. And, and, and Kelly says he finds the pepper to be overpowering on the wine. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a lot of pepper, man. So my, my, one of my comments with this is like, this is kind of why Syrah and Petit Syrah and Shiraz are really, really super good with like mole and like barbecue and steak au poivre and foods that have like peppery characters to them. And I even like these with like, like Northern Indian food, it can, can work as long as it's not too spicy. Um, and then interestingly, like when we get into the two sp really spicy stuff, like the super, super strong Petit Syrah kind of starts to work with like spicier Mexican dishes, especially. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, Chris is going deep on the whole um, uh, thing with the, um, like grapevines, the grapes being grafted on roots from Missouri. That's, that's a, that's a man, dude, I'd love to go down that, but this is probably not the best thing. Yeah. And I would definitely say there's like a pepper and violet character to this. So just remember like from this producer and, and folks, when we're getting into this, like, like for me to do a kind of exposition on these three different style, you know, two different styles of Syrah and then Syrah style of Petit Syrah, I really wanted to do a, a Northern Rhone wine because, um, because it's very, very indicative of what, you know, classically what Syrah is about. Um, that being said, like most Northern, most wines from the Northern part of the Rhone, uh, Syrah based wines are much more expensive than this is. So this is kind of a value play from the Northern Rhone and definitely something that's meant to be consumed fresh and uh, not kept for a long time. So a little bit more about that, you know, um, like, like v v Vendée à Côte refers to the geographical location of the wines because they're next to the really, um, some of the best vineyards in, uh, in, in the Rhone Valley. This is in Chevonnet, which is just outside of, which was in saint Joseph. This is all Syrah. Um, oh, it's done in a, un, you know, this is done in an uncertified organic manner. Um, and what do I want to get? And once again, he's only partially distemming this, right? And, um, Sometimes Syrah can sit on the skins for a really, really, really long time to get, extract the color. And he's, that's happening. And he's punching down the cap when we're making the wine. So we're, we're really getting the skins and the, the um, juices to interact with each other. Um, and there's native yeast is used with this wine, meaning he's just using the yeast that's in his, on the grapes themselves and in his uh, cellar or where he makes the wine. Um, and then... 50% of this is, you know, it's, it's aged seven months, 50% of it's in barrels. Eve Cooleron's not really like, Hey man, I, I'm really like, I'm using sexy barrels on this. I bet it's all used Oak actually. And I bet it's like what we would call, um, I bet these are like demi mutes or like larger, older barrels. Cause this doesn't, this wine doesn't come across as oaky to me, but, but when he's with Syrah, a lot of times also, aging in oak subtly exposes it to oxygen and really kind of softens the wine up because Syrah really, 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 really wants oxygen. Mm. 
Jeff just says it's okay. I'm I really uh, love this wine. I love it because it's it's like it's kind of got everything going on at the same time, but no one character dominates to me. I get I get how some people can think the pepper aspect's overwhelming. I sometimes find when Syrah or Petite Syrah are from um, you know really warm climates, like it doesn't taste fresh to me, and the wines can kind of have like. Um, uh, like a like a, a stewed fruit or like overripe fruit character to me. And to me, the fruit on this wine is really in check and has a very fresh character, um, which I really dig. I feel like, like definitely like, like any type of grilled meat would enhance this. And I feel like kind of, ba ba I feel like Syrah is also a really good like burger pizza kind of kind of play and as weird as it is like there's so many great italian wines i love syrah with italian food and have it like all the all the time with stuff that has tomatoes in it um definitely complex and and intense at the same time i can see how this is kind of a polarizing wine because it's like it smells like it's going to be a fruit bomb and then on the palate you're like whoa actually you've got a lot of acidity and like pepper going on and the fruit is kind of like a like in the supporting role um, any like other strong reactions to this or like positive or negative? I'm kind of curious before we move on to the next thing. Okay. What do the skins do to the wine? Well, skins, skins ultimately are what give red wine their color. Like red wine wouldn't be red without without it being aged with the skins, right? So, and a lot of the aromatic qualities of of wine come from from the skins too. So, especially Syrah it can really really sit with the skins for a while. Um, um, like it's not un, un, unusual for people to do a really long maceration and cool fermentation with Syrah to get the most um, aromatic quality out of the skins and the most extraction. Um, wine in a coffee cup. No, nope, it's just water in, in the coffee cup. I'm, I'm a, it's dry. It's cold. It's Wisconsin. I like water too. You know, and like really you're not going to have as bad of a hangover if you drink a lot of water. Great with dark chocolate too. Nothing but positive thoughts about this wine. Divine. Wow. Stephanie, thank you so much. Namaste. Yeah, it's definitely this is definitely a uh, um, definitely a fave for me. The color and flavor actually seem lighter than I see in a lot of Syrahs. Yep. Usually I go for stronger Syrahs, but I like this. This is a good good point. Once again, like we're we're dealing with Syrah from a cooler climate, and um, and it's definitely was intentionally made at a lower um, lower ABV. Um, oh, oops, what we meant was, what do the stems do? Okay, back again to the stems. So stems, when we do a whole, when we age a wine with, with the stems, a red wine especially, um, it, it, there's a tannic quality that happens. Um, we get tannin from the stem, and some kind of spicy, woody aromas happen. Um, most winemakers are very, very careful not to have what they would call like underripe skins or or stems, sorry, and I'm going to use a word that I'm sure a lot of people would probably frown upon, but, but like, like the, the quality, like we think of like a woody taste, like when we get like a green taste of wood, it's like a lot of that's from, I think what we would call lignans in the, in the, um, stems and we're avoiding like a green woody flavor and we want more like a, like a mature kind of woody character that um, gives it a subtle spicy character typically. And I think adds up the soil. Okay, please talk about the soil. So this is granite and um, alluvial soil. So this is granite because that, that's why when we go back and look at like, like most of these hills are formed from granite outcroppings and the river is below um, because literally the river couldn't had to go around the granite. The river is not strong enough to erode the granite and the soils are alluvial because as the river retreats, we're left with like sandy, rocky soils that used to be the riverbed. So, um, granite is, um, 
granite has a very uh, 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 a very high pH, so a low acid, so it 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 helps to positively keep you know it helps to keep the wines like the red wines have fresh acidity. Also, it's got great drainage. It's one of those things like you know wines on rocky red wines growing on rocky soils tend to be really really full bodied and really intense because the soil doesn't uh, retain water. There's a lot of argument. We talk about this a lot nowadays, um, and a lot of sommeliers talk about this. A lot of ampelographers talk about this. Um, a lot of people that are taste scientists talk about this too. We're always like, hey, does the soil make the wine taste a certain way? And there's arguments um, either or. I, I would say that the 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 soil's composition and um, how the soil interacts with the 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 topography um, really has an effect on on the grapes um, due to just certain soils have better drainage um, and I'll talk about that a little bit when we get into when we try the petite Syrah. Um and good great question great question um, my husband finds it very earthy and dusty he can almost taste the granite yeah i mean this is a big thing like too like we tend to we do tend to find like like i tend to find like like this is super stony wine to me like it has an almost chalky dusty character to me like rocks like 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 actual a rocky character to it um and i think you know i, I think part of that is probably th some of some of it's the natural yeast there too um Jeff, you're just saying, no, there's not bourbon in the coffee cup either. Please talk about soil. We did. Yep, we got that. So alluvial isn't about types of rock, but just the fact that it's rocky and well-drained. Yes, that's right. It's it's just a catch-all. Um, oh, James Nelson, uh, open this, guy. Just do do this, my man. The, the Syrah, the first one. There you go. Okay, buddy? There you go. It'll be beautiful over the course of a few days. Okay, so we, we saw this. We saw this. We went to this. Drink this young. Feel free to... Okay, and then we're going to go... We're going to try the raw power Shiraz. That's this guy. We're getting into that next. Ta-da! Yay! Yay! All right. Um, excuse me. Man, these actually have a really similar color to them, but this has got a little more orange thing going on. Does everybody have this? I mean, I know I'm talking in a room by myself, but definitely so much mintier, man. Hmm. Okay, so I've got this map up of Australia, all right? And I'm showing everybody kind of kind of where where this is, hopefully. So you know, think about Australia is about uh, roughly the size of the United States. It's about three thousand miles across. What we're really focused on is this tiny tiny area in South Australia around Adelaide, and Adelaide is the capital of South Australia. Okay, Adelaide's just the capital of the territory of South Australia. Okay, so. Um, and then these, this is what's called the Adelaide Hills, which is um, just south of the more famous area called the, the Barassa Valley. Um, and it's, as you can guess, it's a series of hills. People a lot of times say Syrah likes a view. It, Syrah is grown best, usually does its best on hillside vineyards. Um, a lot of times a hillside vineyard it just has better drainage too. It retains water less. Syrah is pretty drought resistant. Um, as is Shiraz. So you can do it. Once again, it works in relatively cool climates, but um, here we go. We're in a place that's relatively warm here. And this wine actually starts to creep up in the booze level too. This is 15% alcohol. So versus 13 for this for the first wine. And um, it doesn't sound like a big difference, but it's enough, man. It's like, it really, that really kind of kicks the right, we're, we're dealing with a much 
um, riper wine when it's harvested at that point. Um, and something that, that then takes on these more like, like stewed fruits and, um, uh, like really, really ripe character. And we're talking a little bit about the color on this. So, so if folks notice, these are all these wines are really opaque. They're super, super dark. But this wine, the Shiraz, um, has a little bit of a brickish orange, almost, almost kind of brown color on the meniscus or the, the edge of it. Um, this is just due to the wine aging. And I'm surprised actually it's this color because the wine's roughly, you know, this wine actually, think, think about it this way. This wine was probably harvested, it's from 2017, it's 2021. In the Southern Hemisphere, we're going to harvest grapes like in, in like, in like, you know, start in, starting in around March. So, um, this is, uh, this has got a little bit of age on it, but it is, it is a little bit like kind of oranger than I thought it would be. Um, man, it is like a, to me, it's just like a eu eucalyptus menthol bomb with like super sweet pipe tobacco, like, like really like Andy's candies, <laughs> like a mint chocolate <laughs> total. Julie is retracting her comments. What, what did Julie say, man? Um, yeah. <laughs> so full you can almost chew it. Oh yeah. The eight, the wine's like roughly four years old at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Kelly, I, I understand your whole, like, Kelly's comment is, okay, I love you, Nate, but I have to be honest, the oak on the nose is clunky to me, and the fruit is way too fruity. My man, you're probably going to be on the minority with this. <laughs> I, I'm kind of with you there. Like this is like not we're we're doing this for the sake of contrast, buddy. It's not about it's not like it's not like like I mean if we were like Nate's favorites, we'd be drinking dry Riesling orange wines and champagne, and I wouldn't even have these classes, you know. It'd just be I don't know me hanging around drinking old white wine, uh, petting a cat or something. Um, yeah, but. Uh, this wine smells like an old library. Ooh, you might have a corked wine. Is maybe that's weird. Yeah, but I mean that's also not super odd. Cause it definitely like I get the old library thing, because it's definitely got a super woodsy character and it's got some leather thing going on. Yeah. The color is a little bit, a little bit funky to me though. I did I was surprised at it. But once again, it's like one of the things they're doing is they're probably really, really um, giving this, uh, making sure this does get a little bit of exposure to, to wood. So we saw where the wine is from. Let me make sure I'm on the PowerPoint here. And this is, this is, um, this is like relatively old vines here, um, you know, and it's a single vineyard that's called Zupa Vineyard. I know nothing about this. And it's technically the Adelaide Plains um, in, you know, in South Australia. But, um, and, and this is, once again, we talk about a loamy soil over limestone. Limestone has a, a, a high pH, so low acid, which gives you grapes that have higher acid, 15% alcohol. This is, this is, you know, um, once we'll notice down here when we talk about the oak aging, this, so this is 10 months. And it's kind of, once again, a half and half thing where not all of it is barrel aged, but 50% is in um, American hogshead. <laughs> I always love a hot. So a hogshead is just like basically somebody took a, a it's just a normal size wine barrel. And it and the idea is that it has new um, it, it, it typically has a new head put on it. So it's an old it's an old barrel, but then at the front and the back, we put new heads on them. That's, that's usually the connotation to that. 
And it's it's roughly uh, like a 50-gallon barrel. So it's a smaller barrel. Yeah, man. Um, I'm almost on the calling this jammy, too, side. It's got... This is like such classic Australian Shiraz. So... And forgive me, in my one um, regret is that I should have kind of dug a little bit deeper into um, kind of the history of Shiraz in Australia. So we, we've got a guy named James Busby, who's a Scottish immigrant who comes to Australia in the 1830s and brings with him like just a whole, whole cornucopia of, of uh, grape varieties. And people realize like, wow, this, this, Shiraz, as they were calling it, um, which once again, synonym, synonym of, of Syrah, um, is, uh, really does well in warm, dry climates. And it's just the thing that stuck partially because it makes just super, super, super strong wine. And it's, um, and it can be relatively high yields. You can fortify it. It doesn't oxidize. It's it, it's got all the, it's got it, it's very drought resistant. So it's got all the things in a dry, warm place. It's got everything going for it to make. If you want to make lots and lots of wine that's pretty strong and will keep well, it's a good red grape for that reason. And it's what's stuck, and it totally makes sense um, for uh, South Australia. They only make about 3,500 cases of this wine. So it's interesting. We're, we're really dealing with like three three wines that have a roughly similar production. You know, they're they're all, um, you know, under, you know, right around 50,000 bottles or less are made of all three wines that um, I'm doing, or less than 100,000 bottles, I should say. So they're not, by no means tiny production wines, but like pretty, pretty small. I mean, like, like, like in the world of commodity wine out there, these are still all considered what I would call fine wines and um, of like moderately sized production. Um, huge contrast between these. I mean, we see that, you know, like South Australian wines have a tendency to be very, very ripe, really, really strong in alcohol, have super, super explicit fruit flavors that are more on the um, kind of jammy, stewed fruit, um, very, very like, like almost pruny, raisiny character to me on this. And that whole crazy mint chocolate Andy's candies thing going on, which I get out of Australian Shiraz like all the time, especially South Australia. You know, Shiraz from Western Australia, which is a much cooler climate, tends to have a, of a more um, like herbaceous kind of undergrowth kind of character to it. Yeah, this is this. Uh, t having tasted this like a couple months ago, I was like, God, this is like quintessential Shiraz without being like being value, very, very, very value orientated and still being like good wine, you know, like not, it, it hits you over the head, but it's definitely like, it's wine that's aged in real barrels and it doesn't, for lack of a better term, taste super generic. There's lots of delineation of flavors to it and, and kind of layers. It's complex, um, but definitely more intense to me than the uh, Yves Coulouran Syrah. Um, supermarket wine. Tammy said pruny first, yeah. Um, hey man, I mean, if we're gonna do the whole this wine pairs with salty nuts things, that, that's on you here. I'm, I, I, just, I just work here, but yeah, I would, I would agree. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, Saran Shiraz works really well with like, like just just high fat umami foods. It's it's just the wines are tannic and they're strong and they can really handle like savory fatty foods. You know, they've got they've got some pushback. Um, you know, I think things that they don't work work uh, with are like. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to do anything really really delicate. I wouldn't have this like soul. <laughs> Um, I think they're really kind of funky and weird sometimes with anything that's too, too, too spicy, but like smoky peppery flavors are so awesome with a food. And it was interesting, like, like Scott who works here yesterday, he was having, um, 
uh, uh, ropa vieja, like the classic Cuban dish that's like usually like beef or pulled pork with um, green and red peppers and kind of like a tomato and like a tomato sauce. Man, this is like, that's totally a Syrah thing or barbecue anything is Syrah, Shiraz for sure. Lisa Herman, question, supermarket wine. Uh, this is probably in like, I bet the Sendix folks probably carry this or something, but it, they only make 3,500 cases of this, um, the raw power. And like, unfortunately, like, like, like Australia's really gotten, it's basically tripled its exports of wine in the last 30 years. And a lot of that's based on making very, 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 very inexpensive stuff. And it's, it's really hurt the high end of the uh, Australian wine um, industry, or even the mid-tier of the, the Australian wine industry. Okay, um, we're having a 78% dark chocolate with it, and it's perfect. Hey, go for you, man. I mean, yeah, I would say, like, like if, for me, like, a lot of red wines like this and chocolate pairings, like, you want to get a really, really, really dark chocolate, typically. I find that, like, sweeter chocolates and, and like, red wines like this kind of, the sweet thing will give you some astringency, but really dark stuff is usually really makes the fruit pop on the wine. Um, I bet that's pretty good. Um, oh, harp, it goes well with aged Havarti. Yeah, I mean, Syrah can handle cheese for sure. Read up to Robert Mang Ma oh, Mangan's question, please. In general, please compare and contrast, oh, French Syrah and Shiraz. Man, have I not been doing that the whole time? <laughs> okay, so like in a nutshell, like French Syrah is a cooler climate and uh, from a cooler climate and will typically be lower in alcohol than um, uh, Australian Shiraz, okay? Syrah and Shiraz are tomato, tomato, man. They're like, they're the same genetic material, okay? Um, all right, so, um, fr and French Syrah tends to have higher acidity, lower alcohol, and kind of spicier and savory, savory because it because it's less super fruit driven, if that makes sense. Shiraz from Australia tends to have these chocolate minty characteristics to it and be higher alcohol and have very, very, very explicit dark, dark, dark black fruit character to it. Um, and frankly, less floral, like whatever it is, like, like cooler climate Syrahs to me have like m the, the peppers usually more pronounced. And sometimes you get a meaty character to it too, from the French Syrah. Um, and the floral component comes out more too. I'm actually going to drink a little bit more of the Syrah now, the cooler run. Man, love it. Kelly Wall, I, I, I definitely, I don't think everyone loves me. I've, I've, I've scorned a couple, couple of folks. It's been a long, long time, but you know, just, just trying to be a better dude on the daily. Um, yeah, Jeff, you and I just have to like not both be drunken on Facebook, and and I even love you then. So um, <laughs> it takes like both to happen though. We both have to be drunk and both have to be on Facebook for it to get weird. All right. I'm going to stay off. <laughs> um, okay. So any kind of questions about that? I, I really, you know, this is my parlor trick always, folks. I'm going for a really wide kind of compare and contrast. Usually if I'm only going to do three wines, I want to have them be pretty damn different from each other. And I hope this illustrated that. Um, yeah. In a nutshell, the uh, French Syrah has kind of less of a of extremely oaky character. It's cooler climate, higher acid, lower alcohol. The Australian Shiraz, more oak, more fruit, more booze, less acid. Um, kind of interesting, right? 
Try that. True that. Yeah, for sure. It is true that. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, wow. Weird. Okay, everybody. Facebook is for people who use typewriters. I'm kind of, I'm kind of with you. I kind of just lurk on it. I don't, I don't really try to engage too much. Um, this is, thank you. This is a nice variety. I'm, I, I hope you think it's a nice variety. Okay. I did want to um, do this whole thing too and, and point out with the, with the Shiraz, like this is, this is a totally distemmed wine too. So that's a little bit different and kind of why some of that spiciness isn't as pronounced as it was in the, um, the Syrah. Um, and it's doing kind of larger American oak barrels and then the French oak hogshead. Um, yeah, man, this is this the the wine's got some wood on it for sure, man. Yeah. Oh wow! All right. Ah, here we go. So now we're gonna now we're gonna like let's just take a sniff of this Mettler Petit Syrah. This is this that that it's a character that wines from from Lodi and I'll, and we'll get into the Lodi map a little bit. Wines from Lodi and Paso Robles in California both tend to have a character that I call potpourri and it almost like it almost transcends um like it, it, it's almost all the red wines have that character and and I don't know man if I were going to like be a wagering man I would say that there's probably some like yeast strain that's in both of those areas that that are natural yeast that contribute to that that character and it's in them a lot and i do get this whole potpourri thing on this it's really pretty floral too and like deep 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 down in there is like a it's just a total 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 like just bacon slash open pit barbecue thing going on Oh, and Ross is saying he gets anise because we're moving on to the Petit Syrah. All right, I'll, I'll do that. I'll just make sure we're all on the same page here because we're, we're getting into to booze land. Whoa, Metla, Petit Syrah. Here we are. All right, so um, I try not to just, you know, read the whole thing, but this is important, right? So Petit Syrah in France was known as Durif. Um, all right. And it was, and it was called Duraf because the guy, um, the, uh, the, a botanist named Duraf created it in Montpellier, um, which was really kind of the main, you eno know, um, university in Southern France in the 19th century. Um, it, yeah, it's a cross between Syrah and a grape called uh, Pelerousson. And Pelerousson is another thing that was from eastern France, too. Um, and uh, Charles McIver brought it to um, the west coast of the U.S. early, early, early on. And it petite, in this sense, um, refers to the fact that the clusters or the berry has very, very small berries berries or the grapes themselves would be smaller than normal Syrah. So when you have a lower, um, a lower, a smaller berry, you have more skin and less juice. So the wine is darker in color when you make wine, when you actually make wine from it because there's more skin, less juice. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I recommend this a lot too. And just a couple notes on Petit Syrah. Um, and I, and man, you know, I should have hindsight's 2020, 20, but, but decanting all these wines is really, really beneficial. Decanting Syrah and Shiraz based wines, Syrah and Petit Syrah based wines is really, really a good idea. They really, really love oxygen. Um, but serving these just a little bit below room temperature is um, is beneficial for everybody. You're going to get more like the floral characters from the wine, and there they'll be like like some of those more subtle aromas will 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 be there, and it won't just be like booze and fruit. Um, 
Yeah, man, waiting for a while with these things. This this wine will be great tomorrow, guys. I'm I'm telling you. Um Ah, uh, this warm climate grape often loses too much acidity and fruit within the first seven years to make it a contender for long-term aging. That said, a few producers from Nap and Sonoma have made some outstanding wines that will age 10 to 20 years. If you're looking for this, check that the acidity and fruit are in balance with the tannin. They'll be big, but in balance. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Like, like when, once Petit Syrah loses its fruit, an acid, you don't, man, it's just this, it just turns into a super, super clunky, uh, big red. And once again, we're, look at where this, this wine comes from Lodi. And this is kind of where really a lot of value for Petit Syrah comes from, um, which is just north of Sacramento. Um, we're going to look at that. Um, Hopefully this makes a lot of sense to everyone. Okay, sorry, I said north of Sacramento. I meant south of Sacramento, and it's literally just south of Sacramento. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about... Um, Haha. <laughs> um, oh, wow, Kelly Wall is saying he gets... Uh, uh, well, hold on, wait, 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 we're going back, we're going back. Okay, petites are more subtle in general. No, the idea of petite is really that the grape is just smaller. Not that the the wine itself is more subtle, but it's 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 a smaller grape variety. It's technically not Syrah. It's a total misnomer. Um, but it looks a lot like Syrah and ripens like Syrah and has a similar leaf to Syrah because Syrah is one of its parents. So when we look at Lodi, where this wine comes from, um, you know, it's just south of Sacramento. And what's interesting is like we have two river deltas in the United States, right? Like like as in rivers that empty out the freshwater emptying out into um, into saltwater and forming an actual delta system. The most famous being the Mississippi River and the second one being the Sacramento River, man. Isn't that it's so crazy, right? So this Lodi is really the confluence of a variety of rivers, um, like eventually leading into what is, lar is the larger San Francisco Bay. So we can see this on this map. And this area called the... Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this, so just bear with me. But the uh, Mokalumne River down here, where I'm circling this kind of like light blue area, this is like probably where the best stuff from Lodi is coming from. And the wines tend to be grown on sandy soils. And we're going to look at this. Um, Lodi, until like, man, until about 20 years ago, people just did not take wine from here seriously. Um... You know, this is where, um, you know, well, well, uh, you know, the Woodbridge winery that Mondavi, Robert Mondavi's family created, came here to really source value wines um, because he saw that, that the, like there were high yielding, decently good fruited wines that could come from here. So um, lest I digress, let's talk about what old vines look like in this area. Check this out. These are like, it's super, super sandy soils. And interestingly, though, though I talk about like how this is re relatively like kind of super opaque for Petit Syrah and really, really full body. But, but um, sometimes we think about sand and, and its association and, and typical how close it is to water. But, um, Hey man, the reason there's water there instead of sand is, or sand there instead of water is because water moves. If you pour water into sand, the water just goes right through it. Sand doesn't retain water. So when you grow grapes in sand, you get really, really, really concentrated grapes. <laughs> and that's what's going on with this uh, uh, Mokalumne River area of, of Lodi. You get really, really, really concentrated grape varieties. Um, 
I was wondering if it was odd. I was picking up Sense of the Sea. Aquarium is another way to say it. Uh, drinking it with good prosciutto. I get some mint after eating it. Man, I don't know. You know, like, like it's interestingly, I don't think of these wines as having a sea character, but the more you see it, I mean, they're pretty close to, to, to the bay. And there's definitely that, the, um, the sand, you know, to them too. Yeah. And I get kind of in a weird way, I get kind of a nori smell and I don't want to introduce this as like a pejorative concept, but it's got a little bit of like an actual seaweed kind of character to it. Um, and I mean that in a really actually like positive, positive way. It's like a savory, um, uh, like a, just a, like a savory kind of sea breezy, like sea plant character. So I see where he's coming from with the aquarium thing. That's wild. Wow. But it's also like, like I get the, I get like mint, anise, um, like a actual blackberries. Like that's a more, like a more of a blackberry fruit on it. And then like, like still the crazy potpourri thing. And, and deep down there is just like, like bacon or like a meaty, like a, like a really like, like a smoked meat character. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, nori, like the stuff you wrap sushi in. Sorry for the silence here. Crazy wine, wow. Somebody said sage sausage. I love that, yeah. Sorry, the deep, the deep, deep sniffs. A lot is going on in this wine, wow. Isn't it crazy? Like, I mean, this is Lodi and it's California and it looks like the moon, man. Or it, I guess it just looks like a beach without water. It's just total like desert looking sand, man. And those are gnarly, gnarly old vines. Those FYI, those probably aren't Petit Sarah. These are probably Zinfandel vines, you know? Um, yeah. So a little bit about this family um, and by no means, here's a big thing I want everybody to think about. Like, like when we're, when we start dealing with like petite Syrah and, uh, and petite Syrah is really something that's, that's almost, um, solely associated with, uh, um, California at this point, there's some grown in, in Australia as Durif, but Durif itself is not, is like, is means nothing in France. You know, it's like, who gives a shit? Um, so they only made, they made less than 2000 cases of this. This is such a cool family. I can't even like, like, so they're fifth, the Mettler family are fifth generation, um, grape growers in, um, in, uh, in Lodi, um, which is so, so awesome. Um, and I don't know if they call this explicitly old vines let me look on here um da, da, da. yeah i mean it's um oh the lodi microclimate is a true mediterranean climate excellent for growing petite syrah high day daytime temperatures are tempered by delta breezes with flow through the area in the evenings and cool down the fruit dramatically. The vineyards for the Mettler Petit Syrah are grown in the Mokalumne River sub -Appalachian. This is historically the center of Lodi wine region and where most of the Mettler vineyards are planted, referred to by some as Old Lodi and known for its well-drained sandy soils. Um, I mean, that's, I've kind of talked about that too. So um, they don't really, I don't get like the technical data of like how much oak they, this has got some wood on it though, for sure, man. Um, 
And it and it's a definitely a French oak friend too. How can you tell the difference between the vines? Chris, oh man, like dudes have straight up jobs doing that. They're called ampelographers, the guys that um, look at the vines and can tell the difference. And it's more um, based upon them looking at the fruit and um, like the shape of the canopy and the shape of the leaves themselves and uh, the shape, size, and color of the berries as long and the um, shape of the clusters of the berries. Um, and then obviously these guys can do all kinds of DNA testing nowadays. Um, yeah, so so I do I don't want to say one thing I want to want to make it, it abundantly apparent is that that like Lodi as a wine region in California is like a not all ships are rising with the tide. There's garbage ass Lodi wine. <laughs> I really want to show off this because it's like it's um it's very very high quality wine from Lodi. This is actually lower alcohol by volume than the um, Shiraz. It's fourteen point two. Mm. Shoot, let me tell this to everybody. So I have all the wines for sale on our website. I should have said this at the beginning. Please, if you're going to order them from the tasting tonight, um, sorry, my nose, I'm super, super itchy right now. Um, it's very dry in here. But if you're going to order the wines via the, order the wines via the website, please put a pickup date for the, this following Wednesday or later. This allows me to get everything here for everyone and have no snafus. So if you put a pickup date for any of these wines for Wednesday or next Wednesday or later, I have them all on sale. Um, the, the Yves Couleron Syrah is 1899 or 1898. The Raw Power Shiraz is going to be 1298 a bottle. And this Mettler Petite Syrah is going to be 1698. So we did pretty deep sales off the you know regular price. Um, I think all these wines are are um, for kind of I would drink them over the next two to three years, 100, 100 percent, all of the above, two to three years. I think they're I picked these because I thought they were all in. A place where they're really really nice right now um and totally ready to drink value orientated expressions of all of um you know of syrah shiraz and petite syrah um and relatively unique to one another but really at their, they're in their optimal drinking windows um not a big california wine person but i prefer this over the other two. Oh, interesting lisa yeah i mean Sure, definitely a different jam. Interestingly to me, like this is the most, like, like this is the least complex wine to me, but it's really intense. Um, if that if that makes sense, and uh, I know, dude, Chris, every time, like like the credence thing. Yeah, I'm a big fan, and it, it's I, I think of it every single time. And this is the Lodi he he's talking about in the song song from Credence. Um, what is the regular price on the Mettler? Jeff Kotke, the regular price on the Mettler is $19.99. And Jeff Kotke and everybody out there, I think we're going to email this Mettler Petit Syrah pretty soon. That being said, I, I'm going to, I'm giving the people, I'm, if we do, if we do email it, I'm giving you that $16.98 price is, would be the email price. And this gives you, uh, uh, if we emailed it, it'll probably sell out and because they didn't make a ton of this wine. So I'm kind of giving everybody a little, like, like I'm letting you buy this ahead of the email, if that makes sense. Cause I bet we would do it in the next couple weeks. It's complicated at Ray's how we do the emails. Um, does any wine growing region have a better song than Lodi? Bob, fuck no, man. Lodi has the best fucking wine song for sure, man. I love it. I love that idea. <laughs> yes. Burgundy has some pretty cool folk songs and traditions, but no, nah, man. 
Lodi by Credence. Best song. Best wine region song. Pretty negative connotation to that, though. Dude, uh, yeah, every, seriously, every time, every time, me too, every time I hear about Lodi, it never gets old being, oh, no, stuck in Lodi again. You know, the whole thing. It never gets old, man. Got it. Thanks, Nate. Thanks. Dude, appreciate you, brother. Yeah, I know we're out there. You're out there. I promise I'm not going to get all humped up and, like, start ribbing on, like, you know, Austrian school economics or, like, talking, you know, shit about Milton Friedman or something online tonight, okay? Yeah, a couple F-bombs. One hour. Oh, you're giving me one hour? <laughs> Dude. Hey, man, if I only had a dollar for every song I sung... This is starting to come off the wheels. Okay, so in conclusion, do we have any questions, man? I'm I'm open to the questions here. You know, I'm I'm fascinated by like like the Northern Rhone really being a wine region for like two thousand plus years is pretty amazing, and really the Romans figured this out like to grow. They just looked at the slopes and were like, these are they the they after. You know, after a while, they're like, the best wine comes from here. And they were like, this is the grape that works. And and it, they everybody's kind of taking it from there. There was a point, and I talk about this all the time, so it's like a broken record stuff. But there was a point in the Northern Rhone where it was, especially in like Cote Roti and the very extreme northern part of it, where it was more profitable for farmers or vignerons there to grow apricots than it was to make wine, which is so crazy because the wines now go for like, like they're some of the most expensive, expensive and heralded wines on earth. Um, <laughs> oh, whoa. Hey, in another life, I used to actually sing songs and stuff. That That's a whole other thing. Um, maybe someday again. Um, <laughs> great job, Nate. You always steer Rob and I right. Oh, hey, hope. That that makes me feel good. Let's start over. Go in reverse. <laughs> yeah, these are three really different different wines. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, guys, the parlor trick, I mean, any Yahoo can go grab three wines off a shelf and, like, get hammered and talk about them online. Like, the trick is, like, picking out three things that are, you know, indicative of, of the regions and the styles and what kind of makes these these places different. That's the um, – if we are making a course meal with each of these wines, how would you stage and pair the three? Damn, girl. Really? Man. Um, Stephanie, um, you know what? Uh – you know, Stephanie, email me your phone number. How's that sound? Okay. And then I'll get back to you. Let's talk on the phone about that. Um, do a Northern Rhone tasting. Ted, I promise, like eventually we'll do a Northern Rhone tasting and it'll be really cool. It'll probably be crazy expensive, but we're just going to do it. Who cares? Right? Like just got to do it. Got to do it. I'll do it. Like anybody that's come to one of the tastings where I like decant a ton of stuff, I'll do a Northern Rhone tasting where I decant a ton of stuff and we'll taste some like older shit and like somebody will be mad because like you can't buy one of the wines or something that'll happen and we'll taste really good stuff i promise we'll we'll do one because i'm I, I like freak out and geek out about these wines and i've i've been to this area of france twice and it's like it's mind-boggling like i can't i can't recommend going enough because it's it's pretty bucolic but it's really close to Lyon, and Lyon is like like i'm not i'm not rick steves but Lyon is the place to go in france because like it's like amazing food it's never crowded it's totally walkable. It's gorgeous. The weather is pretty great. If you don't like, I like hate hot weather. So I love to go places that aren't super hot, but like, you know, like warm for a Wisconsinite. Um, 
Thank you, Nate. Uh, we were having beef roast. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, like these. This. I mean, Syrah, Shiraz, Petit Syrah, like and red meat is pretty. Pretty like every time you're gonna hit a home run. You know, I even think more so than Cabernet, and especially if you're if you're if you're if you're like have a smoked or um, you know like like smoked or grilled character, hundred percent. I mean, these are the wines for it, in my in my humble opinion. Portuguese, please, yeah, Portuguese, Portugal's on there. Portugal's Portugal, I could do with three wines in a cool way. Um, we're having a standing rib roast for dinner. Which wine would you pair with that? I'm going to be honest, man, and, and, and everybody's going to kind of be like, whatever. I definitely think this Couleron Syrah is the food wine. I like 100% would find like that wine for me, I think would give me absolutely the most pleasure with food. It's just because it's got the best acidity. So it's got the mouth watering thing and it'll really, really like it'll sweeten up. As soon as you put it with something that has like a savory sauce with it, it'll really sweeten up. Um, <laughs> we'll do it whatever no dude i got if i do the northern rhone thing i got it's got to be a in we got to like i got to do that in person i promise that'll be like one of the first ones i'll do when we get this shit all back man um thanks and so cool yes we buy wine instead of traveling <laughs> me too <laughs> jesus christ man <laughs> i drank so much champagne like if i my, my joke is like if i fell down and broke open like like champagne and and like cheese would come out of me <laughs> plug the next tasting okay we're doing a tuscany tasting in two weeks from today and i'm i'm working on getting for march i'm working on getting like somebody from sonoma and um somebody who is from wisconsin but so but now makes wine in california i'm working on that i gotta finalize that next week or else i'm just gonna do my own stuff. Um, I want you to walk me through truly. Oh, the Syrah. Wait, 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 wait. Plug next tasting. I plug the next tasting. The Syrah was the one here. It will go with almost anything. Yeah. In my opinion. Yep. Yeah, to me, to, for me too. I want you to walk me through truly appreciating Bordeaux. Yeah, man, Jeff, sometimes I have a hard time truly appreciating Bordeaux, you know? Um, um, I mean, to me, I get the most pleasure out of actually the Merlot-based wines from Bordeaux, and I think they're kind of the best values. But I, I would love to do another Bordeaux one, too. I think that definitely we will be. Um, we all miss real wine classes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not that close. The real wine classes have so many more wines. Um, <laughs> I bleed cheese. Dude. Jeff, next time you're in the store, we'll talk about John Edwards. Okay, I'm going to call it in like five minutes, okay? So at 6.21, I'm going to turn this off, okay? Because I got to get some food in my belly at this point. Oh, yeah, I would love to do a Greek one. Greek, Greek that's a really good idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a Greek one too. Yeah, um... Depends how much more of this shit goes on. Gre I'd love to do Greece with a bunch of wines if we did it. Like, like it deserves to have, like, like seven, eight wines. Um, yeah. I actually have a dude who's a master psalm who would just just crush and do an amazing Greek wine tasting. Do we email to get these special prices? No, the special prices should be on the, on the website right now. The special prices are on the web. What? Yeah, dude, John Edwards got fired from, from my former employer. Winebow doesn't employ him anymore. Order food, keep talking. <laughs> I'm getting sushi from Rice and Roll on the east side tomorrow, though. I'm telling you that. Um, okay. Um, we'll eat along with you with octopus. Hey, I stopped eating octopus after I watched that, like, my octopus teacher documentary. <laughs> Pink Floyd. <laughs> what? 
This is getting crazy. My oh oh yeah, dude, Chris, we'll we'll do the white wine thing. I know I've done all red wines, man. It's been like all red wines for like four months. A, we live in Wisconsin. It's super cold. B, you people buy red wines when we do the red wine events. <laughs> I'll start to mix it up really, really soon. I promise. I promise. In fact, like, like definitely in March, I'll do, I'll do red and white wines together. Yeah, man, not the pine stuff. Yeah, Ted and Andrea, I'm not going to do a fucking Ritzina, okay? We're not going to drink some goddamn Greek pine shit wine. It's like, it's so much more than that. Like, I promise. <laughs> God, that stuff is so fucking horrible. God, it's so gross. Why? <laughs> Why? I mean, these people have like a like the oldest, probably like one of the oldest wine traditions. But like most of us just know that the Greeks put this wine, like pine resin in the wine. And that's our first experience with Greek wine. It's man, not not a good, not a good foray into the culture. <laughs> um. <laughs> Oh, this is just totally going off the rails. Okay, I'm going to shut it down really soon. Thanks, everybody, so much. Like I said, the Tuscan class is in two weeks, um, and I'll have new new stuff up for March very, very soon. The Tuscan class is going to review um, a grape called Chilagiolo, which is a kind of minor blending grape of Chianti. We will do uh, like Toscano Rosso from a classic producer called Palazzino, which is all Sangiovese. Um, and then a Sangiovese Merlot blend from Tolani, um, which is a, like kind of a baby super Tuscan. So they're kind of, I call it variety and values. Um, once again, if you want to get any of the wines, you can, you should, can order them from the website. They're all on the website right now at the discounted prices. And please put a pickup date of, uh, next Wednesday or later. <laughs> no, Nate, no. <laughs> Dude, you're killing me, Jeff, man. We're, I'm, I'm going to slide into your DMs, Jeff. <laughs> All right. Um, the worst wines I've had are from Arkansas and Greece. Oh, man. Wow. Well, I don't even know what to say. See you the F later. Thank you for the very informative. Oh, thank you. Tuscan date. Yeah, Jeff, I'm here for you for the Tuscan date. Oh, uh, yeah, the Tuscan date is the 20th. Uh, Tuscan date is um, February 20th. It's on the website. No, Nate, no peace. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. All right, okay. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs>